everyone, and welcome to Brought Music Live. Uh, with me from their home in Stratford is Philip Addis and Emily Hamper, and they're going to be our guests for today's program. You will remember that we started this whole series with Philip and Emily and ran into some severe technical difficulties, and now this is take two. So we hope that you'll enjoy it. Please have your questions ready. Uh, you can uh, type them in on the Facebook Live feed, and we'll try to answer them as they come in, uh, likewise on the Facebook Live field. Uh, not field is the right word, but in any case, when you, when you type it in, we'll, we'll be able to answer you um, by typing as well. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being with us, and like to thank Philip and Emily particularly for agreeing to redo this whole program, along with their son, Sebastian. And uh, we're going to start out with uh, the Largo al Factotum from Rossini's The Barbiere di Siviglia. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
Tumultuous applause. That was fabulous. Thank you so much, Philip and Emily. Now we're Thank honored you. to welcome you to this Brat Music Live series. Uh, you were scheduled, Philip, to be in Parma, Italy, I understand, for a production of Debussy's Pelias and Melisande. And our current COVID-19 situation must therefore be a little frustrating for you. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, uh, actually, uh, as everyone knows, things got pretty bad in Italy. And it was right during the time that I was there, in fact, after a dress rehearsal, um, everyone involved in the production had to flee in the middle of the night because of uh, an impending lockdown on the city. So I was on a train at four in the morning and on a flight the next uh, morning out of Bologna. And it all sort of evaporated, as happened for so many people. Indeed. Well, it's a theater that I know very well because I was fortunate to... Uh, do a production of Il Battaglia, La, La Battaglia di Legnano, a very oh. unknown Verdi opera there in Parma, and uh, really enjoyed it so much. I, I actually had the honor of conducting the, uh, the chorus of the theater uh, in front of the Verdi monument. I don't know whether you saw the Verdi monument oh. in the town it's square. Hard to miss. <laughs> yes, <laughs> for the 199th birthday celebration of Verdi. So it was quite, quite a special thing. And I got to go to Busetto and to, to meet all the people. So it was quite, quite lovely. So I can understand what you must, what, how frustrated you must be. I would certainly be. Now, Philip, yeah. you're also in the midst of a fabulous career. You sung at Opera di Roma in Luxembourg, in Japan, at the Hamburg Staatsoper, in the Paris Opera, and in the principal opera houses of, of every city in Canada, Vancouver, Victoria, Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Opera de Montréal, Opera de Quebec and all over the United States. Also, you're known as a recitalist worldwide, together with your wife, Emily Hamper, whom we're lucky to have at Broad Opera as principal coach and artistic administrator. Um, you are going to sing, I understand, something now by Gerald Finzi? Yes, um, a little bit of Shakespeare from here in Stratford. This is uh, Finzi's setting of It Was a Lover and His Lass. Was a lover and his last with a hang and a hold that came on each hold. And all the green corn fields did pass in spring time, the only pretty ring time. When birds do sing, they ding a ding a ding, sweet lovers. Take the press. 
Such a delightful piece, and Charles Fizzi is such a wonderful composer, British composer. Now let's talk a little bit about Emily. Emily, you've had a distinguished career as a pianist, a vocal collaborator with Opera de Montréal, Calgary Opera, Pacific Opera, Victoria, just to name a few. And we're so fortunate to have you as principal coach and artistic administrator at Broad Opera. Together with Philip, you're co-founders of the Stratford Vocal Academy, and both of you are parents of a highly talented son, Sebastian, who is our next performer. Sebastian, yes. are you there? Right here. Ready? Come on in. Hello. Hi, Sebastian. How are you today? I am doing well. How are you? What's it like being uh, isolated from all your friends at school? Uh, it's, it's kind of weird. Like, yeah, it's just weird. We're doing work, but it's not with the other people. It's like we're all at our houses and we're sort of like with them on like virtually, but then we're not actually with them. So it's kind of weird. Well, it's certainly an unusual situation for us all. But you know, I think that you're indeed fortunate musically in any case, because you're in this wonderful household of highly accomplished musicians. What's that like growing up in this household where everybody's playing and in active musically in a professional sense? There's like music going on at practically every single time of day. Like sometimes we're like all practicing at the same time on different floors and like instruments get passed down as well. Like this violin's, this violin was, it was my mom's when she was about my age. And I didn't know you played the violin, Emily. I did, not well, but I did. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. So you can help your son, that's super. Well, my own upbringing was in, in a way similar, except under smaller circumstances. We all lived in one room in my grandmother's and grandparents, my grandfather's fourth floor walk-up apartment in, in front of l'Université de Montréal in Montreal. And my parents practiced the violin and cello and my dad wrote his music and, and all of that was happening while I was still in a crib. Um, so the only way to get their attention was to play too. Uh, and so that was a bit about my upbringing. Um, what are you going to play for us? I'm going to play Polish Dance by Edmund Severn. He was like an English-American, and Polish Dance is his most famous piece. He usually based his songs off of, like, already existing folk tunes. And, yeah. Or well, I look forward to listening to it. Oh, you do. Excuse me. You want to check your tunes?
Thanks so much, Sebastian. Going to ask if you could center the camera just a bit more. It's a little bit too much to the left. Uh, Philip, if you could move it a little bit more to the, to your, that's it, that's great. Okay, that's wonderful. Now the next work, thank you very much, Sebastian. That was fabulous. We'll hear from you again before the show is over. Uh, the next work we're going to uh, perform is from Tchaikovsky's opera, Eugene Oneginen. And the text is, I believe, a tr loose translation, if I were destined for the life of a husband. So I guess this brings me to some personal stuff. Philip and Emily, how did you both meet? Oh, that's not so bad. Um, we, we met at the University of Toronto in the year 2000, um, where we were involved with the, uh, the opera diploma program there, the opera division. That's marvelous. Well, having this uh, connection together and being able to do recitals together, that must be a wonderful ingredient for a, for a happy marriage. I know, particularly that my parents, being both musicians, it was it was it was it it made for a great deal of um, sympathetic discussion. You know, you had the p people with the same interests. At least I believe that's a very important part of making a good marriage. It's lasted forty three years for Arden and me, and lasted my parents goodness knows how long. Um, so perhaps you might talk a little bit about the Tchaikovsky. Uh, it's probably the most well-known aria in the opera. Yeah. Um, funnily enough, though, it's not this, this one's not really a recipe for being a good husband. It's, it's Onyegin uh, really being quite patronizing towards Tatiana, saying, if I were destined to be a husband, you know, it would just be misery for both of us, so let's not bother. Uh, you know, and he just breaks her heart with it uh oh that's sad. speaking down to her and then of course at the end of the show he realizes that he too loved her but then it's too late <laughs>
was fabulous. You know, Tchaikovsky is such a wonderful melodist. It's the one thing about him, you can always count on a gorgeous melody, and yet with unusual twists, like starting this aria on an upbeat, dee da 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 dee da da It's an unusual way of, of, of producing a melody, truly inspired. It's, it's, it's amazing, and honestly though, Tchaikovsky's melodies, at least in the opera, always come from the rhythm of the language, just like the Italian composers who really set their language well, or any good composer who's setting text, uses the, the rhythm of their own language. And in this case, the Russian has a bit of an upbeat. So it, it, it creates something unique and specific idiomatic to the language. Indeed. And, and it, it really brings us into our, our next uh, piece because uh, Mozart was, of course, German in origin. And yet I think some of his greatest operas were written in Italian because of his relationship with Lorenzo da Ponte, uh, which is certainly true of, of uh, City Figaro. But before we do that, I want to ask our audience if they would kindly please give us some more questions. And secondly, uh, you know, we're now performing in a sense free for everybody. And it's wonderful to be doing this, but there's no box office. So I would greatly appreciate it for those of you who can uh, send along a donation. Uh, we will be happy to provide you with an income tax deductible receipt. Uh, you can do so on our website, broughtmusic.com. And uh, really would appreciate your generosity at this difficult time for particularly for freelance artists who are uh, not able to perform for goodness knows how long. We hope, we hope it'll be soon. Uh, we've got an opera this year planned for the second week of July, Don Giovanni, um, but it gets less and less likely that we'll be able to do it in public and we'll have to do it uh, virtually. But that's still fun. There's still many, you know, it's making us into being really creative as to how we present our art to people and how it can be enjoyed and how it can be paid for. So I, I always look at it, you know, there's a glass half full as far as I'm concerned, new ways and new ways of contacting a much larger public for a lot less money in terms of per person. Because, you know, they can, 5,000, 10,000 people can watch a performance over a period of time because it's all recorded and online. And who knows, at the end, it might work out well for the box office. So please don't forget to contribute. Now, coming back to music, uh, we're now going to go back to uh, Figaro, but the different, from a different perspective, from the perspective of the Count. Tell us about this aria. Well, in this moment, the Count has, is just piecing together the fact that he's been completely duped by Susanna in particular. Uh, she has used his, um, his major weakness, which is his, his, his lust for her, uh, to extract from him a kind of a promise of a dowry, which dowry will uh, it, which will pay for Figaro's legal fees among other things. Um, and once he pieces this together, he's not very happy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Bravo, 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 bravo. Gosh, you sing Mozart so beautifully. I hope one of these days we get to do Nazi together. Uh, oh, it's just been fabulous. It would be a pleasure. You have, you have a wonderful quality in your voice. It's dramatic and yet it's full of life and energy. It's, it's, uh, and and it's, it has this beautiful warm patina about it, even under these recording circumstances. So thank you. Oh, very kind, thank you. So now, and the accompaniment, I mean, you couldn't ask for better than Emily. She's just marvelous. It's Looking my favorite opera. <laughs> Looking forward to it this summer. More, no more Mozart. More Mozart. Anyway, now uh, we're going to hear some Korngold. Erich Korngold, of course, very interesting composer in the sense, Austro-Hungarian by background, um, emigrated to the United States and became very involved in the film industry and uh, wrote a lot of film scores for major operas, uh, operas, major films, as well as a lot of opera. This is from Die Tote Stadt, is it not? And uh, I, I, I was interested in reading about it because I had the great privilege of studying with Otto Klemperer when I was in London as a young student. And I understand that he was the one who conducted the premiere of this work. Um, so I had a particular interest in it. Tell us about what we're going to hear, please. Well, in this part of the show, it's, it's almost a bit of an aside where one of the comedic players, um, the Piero, just uh, sings at a kind of an after party about, um, I don't know if it's his own uh, uh, experience or not, or, or, or if it's a sort of just a nostalgic song, but it's about having to give up the stability of uh, loving someone at home in favor for a life on the road. Um, as a as a comedian. My 
Bravo, very beautiful, very, very beautiful. Thank you. So Thank you. audience out there, we need your questions and comments. Please send them along. Uh, we'd appreciate that a whole lot. And so uh, moving on from Corn Gold to Debussy, Pelias and Melisande, what you were supposed to be performing in Italy before you were rudely interrupted. Can you help us set the scene, please? Yes, it was, it was a shame not to be able to to share what was shaping up to be one of the finest productions uh, I've been a part of. It's a role I've sung many times. And, um, in this moment, um, Peleas is uh, naively courting Melisande, and as her hair cascades down from the tower where she's brushing it, he's just overwhelmed with the softness and the beauty of it. Je 
Bravo, wonderful music, wonderful music. Um, we have a question from the audience. What is it like to raise a musical child? Well, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, of course, music was even there in utero, especially with Emily coaching uh, all kinds of singers. At that time, we lived in Toronto, and so I'm sure that he had input even in those he heard a lot very early days um, he had an in at the womb <laughs> yes exactly Which is better than womb at the end sorry bad <laughs> <problem>. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i mean we're very proud of him um at the, at the same time i mean it a lot of it comes naturally but but he really works hard too so uh, it's a, I don't know. It, it, it's a balanced life. He has many interests and activities and 
music happens to take up a lot of it, but I think he enjoys it. Um, singing in a choir, playing in an orchestra, it's a very well-rounded and highly sociable way of growing up, I believe. Now, how do you compare that with your own upbringings as ch musical children in your own household? I'll stand. Well, um, for my part, uh, musically, when I was younger, uh, I wasn't trained in the formal way, but there was always music going on in the house, especially guitars and singing and, and the record player. There was always something playing. And um, so I was... I think I developed a good ear and uh, certainly a love for music, for all sorts of music, whether it was, um, you know, stuff on the radio or um, something my mom would often have opera on, uh, you know, PBS uh, or, or NPR, but uh, we, we lived near the Buffalo border. We had better, better reception in Port Colburn from Buffalo. Um, so I was aware of all that, but it, it wasn't a pursuit at first, it was just a part of the fabric. It wasn't until high school that I really started to decide to focus on studying music, um, and they were very supportive right from the outset of that wish, and uh, have always been since. And in my case, despite having played mostly piano, but also some violin during my childhood and growing up in the musical household, it wasn't until the day that I filled in the application for university that I decided to go into music as a, at least at first in my undergrad. And I can relate to Sebastian's experience of having everyone practicing at once. I grew up in a musical household, professional musicians in my parents and grandparents' generations. And I certainly sympathize with Sebastian because I remember waiting in theaters and churches and concert halls for rehearsals to be over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> lying on the floor, <laughs> waiting for someone to be done so we could go home. So it's, um, uh, now I'm doing that, you know, it's, I'm the parent and the child is sometimes dragged along and, and brought lots of activities to pass the time, but it's all going in to his mind somehow and I'm, I'm really happy about that. But that's a very rich experience, certainly I can say from my own background right. because I was my parents didn't have the money for babysitters so I was dragged into everything I, yeah. I grew up in L'Auditorium du Plateau in Montreal with yeah. the likes of Sir Thomas Beecham and Charles Munch and Led Bernstein and, and a whole host of Pierre Monteux of great conductors uh Rodzinski I remember playing dinky toys with Nicky Rodzinski in the in the aisles of <laughs> It, it was it was a very rich background, and we had all sorts of people to dinner. It, it was a it was a wonderful thing, and I'm it sure that it's a real blessing. I think. Yeah. So you we've come to the end of our program, and I understand Sebastian will join you for a piece. Uh, would you like to tell us uh, what you're going to sing and play for us? This is a bit of Gershwin, and. It's nice work if you can get it, which... Uh, two movies, right? Two different movies, yes. Uh, I know it was in American, uh, in Paris. There was one before. There, there, but it was featured in a previous one. I have a name. You'll have to look it up. Everyone go online and, and search it. Um, in these times when not everyone has the same work that they uh, might normally have, or where everything's altered somehow, um, there is one job that uh, hasn't changed too much, so... Where two hearts become one Who could ask for anything 
Bravo, bravo, bravo. Thanks to all three of you. Thanks to Philip, Addis, to Emily Hamper, and to Sebastian, and also to everybody listening. I hope you enjoyed this uh, encore <laughs> program. Um, if you did, please uh, let us know, send us your comments, and if you're so inclined, please uh, donate to the cause of the National Academy Orchestra and the Broad Festival, and uh, to help subsidize programs like this, which we will continue to give throughout the summer, and uh, hope that you will uh, join us and, and watch and uh, bring your comments and be close to those artists who are isolated at home and uh, yet making music. Thank you again for listening and thank you for performing and we'll see you again soon. Bye for now. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.